where Han Sen really politically innovated um, was at the end of the 1980s when he emerged as a proponent of reform. Now, uh, the, ref uh, the reform was designed basically to help the CPP transition from um, a member of the Soviet bloc, a run by a communist party, into a more of a Buddhist inflected populist party. Um, and Hun Sen was one of the main proponents of that shift in 1989, um, above quite a lot of opposition in his own party. And I th so I think the thing about Hun Sen that's the most notable is the lack, his lack of an ideological, his lack of ideology, his incredible political flexibility, his ability to bend with the political winds um, as the circumstances dictate. In some ways, the hopes that the world had for Cambodia at the start of the 1990s were, I think, were grossly over-optimistic. Um, essentially, the hope was that a country that had never experienced any form of popular sovereignty or democratic government um, and just emerged from three or four decades of paralyzing war, revolutionary violence, and upheaval was expected to simply adopt um, not only a democratic system, but uh, its leaders were expected to adopt democratic norms. Um, and I think from the very beginning, there was a wide gap between um, hope and reality. Well, the government has strategically adopted um, the narratives and tropes and language uh, of what um, what has been termed the humanitarian international. It's learned to speak the human rights language, the democratic language um, that, is, that is so um, current at a global level. Um, and it's not just Hun Sen and the Cambodian government that have, been able, that have learned to do this. Um, the opposition, including particularly Sam Rainsy, have also learned to do this. They've learned to mirror um, the preoccupations of their international patrons. I think it shows that the wave of optimism that grips the world after the fall of the Soviet Union um, is, was, it created a false sense of how easy it would be to spread democratic norms around the world. There was a sense that democracy was sort of the natural state of peoples and that if impediments to democratization were removed, which is to say dictatorial leaders, um, that democratic systems would flourish, as if by uh, as, if, as if by magnetic sort of you know, it would happen naturally, um, and I think that was mistaken. I think um, democracy is something that, unlike a car or a piece of technology, can't really be reverse engineered. It's an incredibly complex social and political process that, in the West, took centuries to develop. Um, uh, there were many reversals. There were many periods of violence um, that, that paved the way towards um, the democratic systems of today. Um, you know, another lesson is simply that, like I said before, the, the conflict between and the contradiction between um, strategic imperatives for Western donor countries and the more high-minded or idealistic side of their foreign policy, which is human rights and democratic development. Balancing the two can be quite a challenge. Well, what we're seeing right now is essentially the contradiction inherent in the patronage system of government in this country. Um, essentially, the system is based around keeping powerful people happy. Um, but the system itself has no real aim beyond its own perpetuation. And so what you see in Cambodia is a, a cycle, a destructive cycle, whereby political power is used to gain access to resources which are then used to gain access to more political power in an unending cycle. Um, and the challenge for Hun Sen right now is to arrest this momentum to some extent, to give more back to ordinary people who feel that they've been left out of a lot of the economic benefits um, of the, the economic boom of the last decade. Um, and the extent to which he's able to do that is, is still open to question.
difference. I think that what we saw at last year's election in the, and in the aftermath was the simmering discontent um, burst into the open. Um, people were less afraid about voicing the fact that they did oppose the ruling party when previously they might have kept that under wraps. Um, and I think those demands of the people have to be addressed in one way or the other. The question is, though, whether the CPP is able to address those concerns um, using its time-honored methods of, of distributing patronage, strongman charity, um, you know, the opening of new pagodas and schools. If this effort is ramped up, if, people, if the government goes some way to securing land titles for people who lack them, um, to improving the state of the education and health systems and improving opportunities for people, um, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that a lot of people will, will, will go return to the fold, so to speak, that, will, that they might vote for the CPP at the next election. I think it's capacity building. You know, I think that there's, the term capacity building hints at the idea that all of the challenges of Cambodia are merely a shortfall of resources, a shortfall of knowledge, and a shortfall of understanding. So that if somehow the capacity is built, then, then the solutions will be implemented flawlessly, and that the, um, you know, the, the democracy and, and you know, the rule of law and the division of powers and all of these um, very complicated in, uh, concepts will somehow uh, come to fruition. Um, and I think it's basically a way for donors to sidestep the essentially political nature of development. I mean, if you're capacity building, you're not getting involved in politics, right? But the, you know, the difficulty is um, a lot of the problems this country faces are not a result of capacity. They're results of political will. Um, the government has to have a political will to change the way they do things and um, to change the assumptions on which they govern, which are very deeply rooted in this country. And no amount of capacity building is going to um, change the minds of those in power.